registration process. So what's going on there? Uh, just started recording. Don't stress. That's your fault, Corey. <laughs> yeah. I can hang I can hang a bit of crap on you here. Yeah? <laughs> but um, no, it's, it's actually quite an exciting time of the year because even though there might not be a lot happening on the race course, what's happening in the background in the, um, in the harvesting uh, time of the year when you're, when you're growing the crop is, is quite exciting. So I think Matt would say the same. So we're very happy. Yeah, and Matt, I, I think I spoke to you last week about this, how, you know, not as many runners as, as we would like, but it's exciting getting up every day in winter because you've got all those youngsters coming through, whether it's the two-year-olds that are rising three or now even some of those yearlings are having a look at here and there. Yeah, it's a shame the, the tracks are so wet because uh, even if you you would have seen this morning, we've got a lot of nice young horses trialing very well. And, you know, the, the jump outs at Cranbourne hold a bit of value these days with, with all the big trainers. And uh, when you're showing your hand amongst all the big trainers, then it gets very exciting. So we really can't wait until we have a bit of drier weather and we can get some of these nice young horses out onto the track. And Jack, you're the special guest. So we thought while things were a little bit slow and all our youngsters are coming through, we thought we'd, we'd get some something a little bit different and get an AFL player on here. So I'll touch on, uh, firstly, how are you, I suppose? Yeah, going well. Thanks for having me on. Uh, everything's, we've just had a mid-season break. So we've had a pretty solid uh, first 12 weeks of the AFL season. So it's nice to have a few days off and and get back into it this Friday night. So it should be should be exciting back half of the year. Yeah, and obviously, you know, we, we, we've got you on here because you're a horse owner and we'll touch on that a bit later, but we'll, we'll focus on the footy career to start with, you know, three three lots of, uh, of premierships um, all in a row pretty much. Uh, two All-Australian yep. team selections, obviously a Peter Crimmins medalist and three leading goal kicker awards for Hawthorne. But, You've, you've basically been a stalwart of that Hawks side for a long time now after kicking off your career with Adelaide. But, I mean, where did it all start? Yeah, I started, um, I think, way back when I was probably seven, eight years old, two years of under nines. And from there, it was my life was cricket in summer and footy in winter. I uh, didn't miss a season, didn't miss a beat. Uh, Dad played a bit of VFA footy when he was younger. Uh, yeah, when he was younger, so... It's always been a bit in the family and um, to be honest, uh, my footy journey just slowly got better and better as I got older. I, a lot of my mates were making the rep sides and um, and I was missing out. So it wasn't until I was in my actual draft year that uh, yeah, I thought I'd be a chance to get drafted and um, was fortunate enough to go to the Adelaide Crows. I didn't last there too long. I was pretty keen to get back to Melbourne and uh, chose the right time to come to the Hawks because... As you said, won three premierships and got them all in a row, but also lost one in 2012. So my first four years of the Hawks was all grand finals and that was all I knew, which was, was pretty uh, pretty fortunate start um, to, your, to one of your, I guess, your football journey. So, uh, and from there, yeah, just been at the Hawks for uh, yeah, 10, 11 years now and um, have loved every minute. I've played with some absolute stars of the game and great players and now I get to see this young crop coming through and, Hopefully, I can hang on to watch them all win a premiership as well. And what what would be the career highlight? I mean, you've got you've got plenty. Of what the blonde tips that you had in your early days <laughs> at Adelaide um, that that would have been up there. But other career highlights? Yeah, there was some shocking photos looking back on that. That uh, copped a bit of abuse from the boys back then. Uh, so I got rid of them when I got to the Hawks. But uh, you can't go past the premierships. Look, I. I'm chuffed that I've been able to make the Australian team and, and win a best and fairest and stuff like that. But um, knowing that you're going to have a reunion every 10 years uh, with a group of guys and celebrate what was an awesome season and an awesome day to, uh, I guess, to win um, three premierships in a row is, is pretty special. And um, I think the first one was awesome because we lost the year before and, and then got redemption on the Swans who beat us two years earlier the next year. So, there are probably two moments um, in my career that I've really uh, looked back on now and, and think how good the times were. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've been able, fortunate enough to experience. And um, I really want the group of guys that I'm playing with now to be able to experience that. But we're a bit, a bit of the way off at the moment. So uh, we've got some work to do. Yeah, but bu building nicely. But I guess one question that you get asked a lot, I'm sure, but who's the best player you've ever played with? 
Yeah, it's a tough one to answer now because one of them was actually my coach. He's my coach now. So if I don't say him, he normally tends to hear about it. But um, look, Sam Mitchell, Luke Hodge and Cyril Rioli, like the three of them, they're all brilliant, unique in their own ways. They could change games. Two of them were fierce leaders and one could only have 10 to 12 touches, but um, he'd win, still somehow win the game off his own boot. Um, and then, yeah, like, Lance Franklin, I obviously got to play with him as well. So we had a pretty good team. And um, look, it was great for us young guys to be able to learn off them and, and develop and um, learn the ins and outs of AFL football. Yeah. And hardest opponent you've ever played against? Yeah, good question. I had, uh, I don't reckon I've kicked too many goals on him. Robbie Tarrant, who's now at um, Richmond, he was at North Melbourne for. Most pretty much all of his career, and uh, he's. I think he's, I normally somehow get him. He's got 20 kilos on me. He's a little bit taller, and he's faster. So um, he was a t- pretty tough opponent that um, I struggled to break away from. Yeah, and if you were not an AFL player, what would you be? <laughs> Horse trainer. <laughs> Horse um, trainer, nice. <laughs> no, I, I'm not sure. I'd probably be in the sports management space. So it was something I was probably going to go into. Uh, post, oh, yeah, post schooling, and um, was fortunate enough that I have, have actually done a few courses in that regard. So we'll see what the future holds post football. Yeah, and we're, just for the audience, we've got the Q and A function there again, guys. So throw in as many questions as you can, whether it's for Robbie and Matt on horses in the stable, Jack on his footy career, Jack on his ownership in in racing. Uh, anything you'd like, pop in the Q and A, and I'll try and get through those as we as we go through what we have scheduled. But there, there's Jack. Um, you're quite a bit taller than Robbie and Matt, mm-hmm. which is no surprise. Um, either that or or that they're on their knees there. Um, but but I guess how did you get involved in in race horses? Yeah, it's similar to footy. It started uh, with the old man. Um, Look, I, I'm someone that just loves sports. So any sport that's on TV, any live sport, I was always watching as a kid. And um, I love the build-up to the the races and the, the Melbourne Cups and all these sort of events. And um, I guess as I got older, I, I realised Dad probably owned a few. So he always needed someone to go to the races with. So I'd go, we'd go and watch. And it probably more turned into um, a good father-son, I guess, time to either we go to the footy, we go to the cricket, we go to the races. And... It really got a good bond between us, and um, and then yeah, as you uh, as you get into the AFL system, there's always someone asking you if you want to get into a horse or if you want to do this or that, and um, so it was pretty hard not to, I guess, chuck a couple of dollars into a bit of ownership and, and jump in. And funnily enough, fast forward 12 years, I'm the one doing that to all my teammates. So um, yeah, that's a little bit about probably how we got into it. And um, I think when Dad won his first Group 1, I think that's probably when I realised I want to be in as well. <coughs> yeah, and... and uh, now, oh, Corey, go, Robbie. Yeah. With Jack, with uh, care for others these days in the year 2022, was there any empathy given to Matt and I this day, you know, looking down upon us? When was this? On the photo. During this though. photo session. Oh, I, haven't, I can't see the photos. Can you see this photo here? No. You're looking down upon us here. I mean, this is sort of quite uh, harsh looking down upon us here. We're, we're looking up to you. Can you see no, this photo? On, here? No, it hasn't come up on my screen. It hasn't come up on your screen? No. Can't you see this? Sir? Yeah, I'll, t- I'll try and change it. So what are you doing, Corey? What are you doing? Aren't you in charge of this? Should be there. I had Should it on be before, but I don't know where it's gone. Ah. Oh. That's right. Makes it hard to we're hold, the are we holding the horse here? Yeah, yeah you're, you're holding the horse, yeah. <laughs> Did yeah. Matt and I look at each other, you know? No, most people look down on Robbie, so don't feel bad, Jack. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely <laughs> look down. Hey listen, but... you're, hey, listen, you're the same, Matt. You and I respect each other. We look at this, each other <laughs> eye to eye. So, uh, no, um, so just uh, with, with, with racing, with racing, Jack, I guess, you've had a, a lot of success recently. Obviously, El, El Patroness winning winning the group one. Um, you've had a bit of success with other horses as well, but you've all, as, as we can see there, you've got one with us, your shout Gingy. She goes pretty well. Yeah. And in your, your dad's colors. Yeah. Which is really exciting. Um, 
we uh, we got Dad some racing colours just recently, and uh, we're very fortunate enough to be able to get a few mates into the horse, and um, and yeah, obviously own a big enough chunk to be able to race it in colours. So that was a little um, special moment for the family, and um, that's Dad's sort of uh, footy colours that he wore when he was younger. He played for Strathmore, so um, yeah, it's just something pretty cool to be able to tick off and. And go to the races. I think we we went out yeah a few weeks back to watch her run, and uh, yeah, it was just it was an awesome experience to to see her in the colours and see her run really well. And um, yeah, it's obviously a horse that you guys will probably be able to talk a lot about a lot more. But um, she's showing a lot of promise at the moment. I might touch there, Matt. If you want to let us know how she she's gone so far, for those that don't know, yeah, she's done very well, Corey. She's a really big girl, strong girl, uh, probably. Too big for her own uh, own cause at this at this age, um, but we picked her out in the uh, in the paddocks about eighteen months ago. She caught our eye out of Bayless Farm. She was a lovely young yearling, and we bought her out of the paddock and uh, managed to pick her out as the one for the um, for Jack and his mates and, and the whole team. And uh, start with, with Jack's talking about a cramble, and she ran a fantastic race. I think she ran fourth, and then she backed it up with another fourth at Sandown. So she's uh, been knocking on the door, but we just felt she uh, probably better off waiting, um, waiting for the spring and uh, late spring, early summer. She's going to develop into a nice filly once she just pulls into that frame. She's Jack makes everything in that picture look small, but she actually is a big filly. So. <laughs> and, and I've got the you, photo now. I do look big. You got it now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you actually look massive in that photo. But yeah, um, so so just. Oh. Of course, we talked about ownership, but we've also, we jumped on that as a stable and we got you involved as a brand ambassador at the stable and, you know, off the back of your AFL success, but also because, like you said before, you're, you know, one of the leaders at the Hawks now, but you also speak well, you get other people involved and, and yeah, I guess, how did that come about? And, you know, you've had a look at the stables. What do you like about Griffiths to Cock Racing? Yeah, obviously, uh, when you look at a horse stable, you just want great interaction between people. And um, of, as soon as I came across and, and we had a few conversations, I came down to the stables and uh, I reckon I was ended up being there for probably an hour, hour and a half and just chatting away to obviously yourself and all, all three of you and had a tour of the stables and um, watched a few work. And uh, it's just great people. And um, for me, it's you, you, you want to be involved. You want to feel like... Uh, you're involved and, and you can find out as much information as you can. And uh, and one thing that stood out um, between the stable and, and probably where I'm at in my career was there was a lot of, um, I guess, new development of younger horses. And um, that's probably the direction Griffiths de Cock have taken. And um, they've sort of recharged the stable to, to grow and, and rebuild. And that's exactly what the Hawks are doing as well. So, uh, I thought it'd be a great fit and um, obviously, yeah, then now I've been able to jump into a couple of horses and um, your stable's always open to go down and, and have a look at the horses and been able to take my niece and, and family members down to go check out the horses, which is which is a big part of racing. You, you, you own a little bit of the horse and, and you want to feel involved. So uh, for me, it was a, just a perfect fit. Yeah, and Robbie, we, it's probably something that uh, was missing a bit during COVID as people couldn't come and visit their, their horses, but that actually is open to all our, of our owners now, as long as they let us know in advance, we can organise that. Yeah, 100%, Corey. I mean, <clears throat> the only reason we want to know when people are coming down, we don't want to waste their time or disappoint them, you know, so we want them to come down and enjoy their time. Uh, like Jack said, we want them to make sure that when they do come down, their horse is there, um, we're there, and uh, they can have a great morning and uh, watch their horse train and uh, and uh, and have a look at the activities that happen and, and how the stable runs. So the whole purpose of uh, making an appointment is so that they maximise their entertainment, and that's what it's all about. So, uh, yeah, it's great now that the pandemic has, uh, has lifted to the point that we can uh, they can enjoy the entertainment and, and, and what racing is all about and what ownership is all about. So... Yeah, hundred percent. Come down, make it, make a morning of it. And I mean, as it's it's an incredible sport. You've mentioned before on webinars, Robbie, that it's an incredible sport where you could be, you know, somebody just going to the races as a youngster for the first time. You could be a, an AFL player. You could be a shake, or you could be the queen. Um, you, 
there really is any, when you go to a racetrack, could be anyone there. You could meet so many different people. 100%. Now, we've seen that when uh, when Jack was at the stables. There was guys there that uh, were just in awe of uh, being there and, you know, being around Jack and thinking, wow, how good is this? You know, we're, we're rubbing shoulders with, with an AFL three-time premiership player and uh, and here he is just, you know, one of us, you know, and, and it was amazing. And uh, and I know myself with my experience as a, as a jockey, you know, and, uh, you know, being in the mounting yard with, with owners and, uh, and and Matt, you know, he, he, his dad's, uh, you know, and one of the elite trainers of the world. And uh, and that, that's the amazing thing about racing. You know, you, you can meet so many different people and our owners are welcome to come down and and uh, and, and meet the different people that you meet in racing. And um, and that's the amazing thing about it. And, and here we are, you know, you can you can do this. <clears throat> We've had owners experience that, and 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 as we said a second ago, you know that we've had people come down and you know meet Jack and come and pat the filly that had the photo there that that morning. So why not? Why not take advantage of that? It's, it, that's what sport is. That's what it's about. That's what Australian racing is about. So take advantage of it. It's fantastic. Why not do it? I've got I've got a few questions that have come through, and I've just read one. It's from my father-in-law. Yeah. He, say, he says, ask Jack how long Corey has to wait for the kangaroos to win another flag. <laughs> <laughs> probably a long time. We're recording here? Or? <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Clint. Yeah, probably don't answer that one. So, um, so Bella Rice says, who are the current Hawthorne players or ex-players that have joined you in ownership <laughs> at Griffiths de Cock? And I don't think there's that many, is there, Jack? We might need to get a few uh, of them in, in the Lee Mean Machine. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I went. We went a few, a fair few family members. Yeah, it's more um, family. But yeah, we'll uh, we'll try and get a couple in the lean man machine. But I'm sure there's plenty more that are going to be jumping out that I'll be getting involved in. And um, I know there's a few of these youngsters that are starting to play games now. Get a few match payments, so we'll be able to get them involved. Yeah, plenty. Of, I, I actually used to coach uh, young Harry Sharp. That's the Brisbane Lions, and I ran into him. He was back in in Ballarat in his break, and I sort of hit him up and said, "Need to get the Lions boys involved as well, and hopefully have a bit of a match race between the Hawks horse and the and the Lions horse." That'd be nice. They're getting the, they're on top of us at the moment, so we'll beat them on the track. I'm happy with that. All right, and now we we just might touch now on human athletes. You can't see there because we're we're in the way there, but it just says human athletes versus equine athletes. And uh, what I might do here is start with yourself, Jack. If you can sort of just go through how how it's evolved over time in your career in the AFL in terms of sports science and and that uh, that type of I guess that that section of, of football and sport is, and how it's gone. And then the boys will ask you a few questions and you can compare notes or you can ask them go from there. Yeah. Oh, in AFL, so I've been going oh, 12 to 13 years now. And I guess back when I started, it was all just about how far you run really. And um, do as much as you can on the training track throughout the week. And if you don't break down, sweet, we keep going and we keep going. I, I remember at the Adelaide Crows, it was, three hour training sessions in pre-season then we jump on a bike and and do a bike session for an hour and a half and um that tested our bodies but i think they probably tested our minds a lot more and if i fast forward to now it is we are um analyzed to an absolute t of every nearly every step we take throughout the week so um we will we will get a gps reading on the weekend and say we ran 12 13 k's and Oh, 800 of it might have been red zone, which we classify as sprinting. And then the next section is your sort of jog and then how far you walk. So every step you take is monitored and then um, that'll determine what your week probably looks like. So we'll have two main sessions. If, if you went really hard, you'll have a lighter one, then build it up and then play. So um, you'll see guys that they're getting more managed these days because I guess in AFL circles, it's just so demanding and um, you put in, effort after effort every weekend that you're required to actually train. And if you can't train throughout the week, then some guys, unless they're the absolute stars, are probably not um, getting up for games. So it's just changed so much. And um, I think, yeah, the mentality of being able to play AFL footy is is getting tougher for a lot of people. But, um, yeah, I guess in terms of how you look after your body and, and how you're managed, it's, it's, yeah, down to a T we've got, um, a whole fitness team of probably five to six people and then 
um, a lot of analytics as well. They're just continually growing to try and get an edge on the rest of the competition of how players are managed and how they can get the best out of the athletes for the whole year and not just probably the start of the year. So um, the best teams that win the grand final are able to peak in September and um, I'm sure that's pretty similar in horse racing. You, you build them up and um, they have targets like we have targets of finals and you've got to build them up to be able to peak at the right time of year. Yeah, and Robbie, I guess, how does that sort of fit with horse racing? It's pretty similar, really. Like they're all, all have the GPSs on, you're getting the sectionals, you're getting, you know, all of those things done in horse racing. But if you want to touch on the, how you see it as being similar. Almost identical, really. I mean, we have all the same type of data. We have uh, GPS systems and blood lactates and heart rates and, you know, all the different type of recovery and all the different things that you you look for in AFL and how how many uh, how many distances they run and how their recovery is and all the different things you look for and you know it, it's it's not it's not dissimilar to any type of uh, sport these days, whether it be football, AFL, soccer, whatever. It's amazing how much data they collect. Um, it's interesting to to hear what Jack says about the the bike. I mean. Um, do they still do that now? I mean, the bike you said afterwards, they still do that? Yeah, no, pretty much now. It might be if you don't get out a full training session, you're going spinning your legs for about 20, 30 minutes. And that's the main session you do where 12 years ago, it was an hour and a half and it's full on cycling, yeah. full on going. So why do they do that so much now? I mean, why, why did they change it from an hour and a half to 20? Why do they still do that so much? Uh, well, one, that was probably their philosophy at the Crows was – jump on the bike because it um, works different parts of your body where nowadays it, it's probably just for that little bit of conditioning top up that um, because you manage so much throughout the week to a T that um, they don't go over the top with the extra cardio extra conditioning because you've actually built a strong base from probably a longer pre-season that we have now mm. it's interesting yeah but um, but anyway we were sort of probably talking to each other there Corey but for those that are listening it's sort of uh it's interesting because um, it's amazing how much is involved and how much similarities there are because we do the same, Matt and I, with the horses. Um, of warm-ups, peak, peak speeds, cool-downs, recoveries, data collections, and uh, we do that on all the horses as well to try and determine, you know, we do stride lengths and all sorts of things to try and determine where our horses are at um, so to, to determine uh, peak conditions and uh, performances and you know whether we should continue on with uh, you know campaigns and preparations and whether we put them out and all sorts of different things so you know we we, we don't we don't put those in audio messages because we'd totally confuse the hell out of our owners we just sort of say you know the horse is going in or out or whatever but you know otherwise it gets paralysis by analysis for owners to understand but uh, but for someone like Jack that is on the inner sanctum with sport, he could totally understand what we're talking about. But yeah, par- parallels between sport are very similar from code to code. Yeah. And Matt, I, uh, I know that you're massive on the analytical side. Uh, when I came in and started sort of talking about stats and things that I, I get from soccer when I'm watching a broadcast and and how horse racing misses that in, in some respects and it's always sort of focused on the, the punting side. Um, but there's a lot of analytical data there. And, and I guess the biggest thing I, I remember you mentioning is that data doesn't lie. So if you can collect data on stride length and that type of thing, and, and that mirrors really what Jack said about having a GPS on them in, in a game. And, you know, you, you can look like you're working at the old school days of looking like you were work hard but you you know and you come off with a, a sweat up doesn't really cut it anymore in footy and Matt you you would say the same and what's your take on it all yeah Corey it's a it's an interesting topic because the hardest thing about racing is that horses don't speak they don't talk so you know it's not like a player which you can communicate via language our job as trainers is to, you know, use a bit of art and a bit of science. You know, the science, the data is all fantastic, but we've also got to have that bit of um, art and feel for the horses and, and always watching them, their behaviors and, uh, you know, the things like their appetite, the way they move. We've got to be on top of the ball when it comes to those kind of things as well. 
Um, and the other thing is, you know, the, the difficult thing about racing is that, you know, if Jack's gone to a game, run too far, and the data analysis says he's going to be fatiguing, they sub him off and come on with a new player. But when we, uh, you know, if we've stretched the horse too far and gone too deep into a prep, we can't just sub it in for, you know, another player. That that horse, that specific horse is its whole team. It's got to go out for a spell and have a rest. So it's uh, very individualized racing. And uh, the beauty of a team sport is that you've got a bench to, to rely on, although it's still individual with all the analysis. Uh, but it's just, it is good to, to listen to Jack and to, to hear things like, um, I think the biggest thing with analyzing data is injury prevention, uh, trying to, you know, prevent horses that are fatigued from overdoing it and hurting themselves and having a bad experience. And then it affects them mentally and physically. So there's so much to, to so much to analyze and to think about. Um, but sport, that's what makes sports so fantastic. Um, I have a question for, for Jack. Um, you know, around the world, top sportsmen like Gary Player, uh, Sir Alex Ferguson, Michael Owen, I think the New Zealand captain, they all own racehorses and all like they all thrive off the success of winning a race or owning a horse that wins a race or breeding a horse that wins a race. Why? What is it that top sportsmen like yourself and Gary Player and those guys, why do they seem to, you know, drift towards owning a racehorse and, and get that? almost adrenaline rush of racing. What is it that, that brings sportsmen to, to ownership of, of horses? Yeah, I've, the adrenaline rush when you mention that is is a fair bit of it. I think it's the, for me, it's the thrill and the build-up. Uh, I love, I'll, if my horse is nominated, the next four or five days, it's I'm checking the odds, I'm getting the updates. Yeah. I'm chatting to the boys it's like are we going to go and let's do it together which is why i always want to own horses with people that i um whether it's teammates or family or whoever it is because you want to share in the spoils together when things do go well so um for me it's the build-up and it's the journey and that's probably something that we're so used to it's everything's a journey like i got into probably my first couple of horses and i was like sweet we're going to win straight away we're going to do this we're gonna get yep get to the peak races that it wants to and then you soon quickly learn that it doesn't work like that and then you actually relate it back to our own journey like for the hawks now we're like we're a fair way off winning the premiership now but it's a journey and that's probably like horse racing in a way it's not everything happens straight away and if it does you've, you've probably got pretty lucky so um yeah, yeah for, for for me it, it's the thrill the adrenaline the nervousness i love the butterflies of race day for me honestly is pretty similar to football so um there's all of those things combined that i think just draws sportsmen and sports people into into the horse racing industry yeah and uh david kemerich uh is just asking when speaking of the hawks when do you think that they'll taste uh premiership glory again yeah i'm hoping um I, I, I'd be surprised if we're not playing finals uh, or close to finals next year. So um, I think we've probably exceeded ex – we've only won four games, but we've probably exceeded expectations this year. Um, we've lost to oh, top – about five of the top six teams by under three goals. Um, and we've had some young kids that have really developed and continuing to learn and fast-track their development. Um, so – Look, we'll be, uh, we've got a pretty um, nice run in the next six weeks, so hopefully we can play some pretty good footy. But uh, I'd say the Hawks are going to be back competing uh, in finals as early as next year. Yeah, and it's a tough question because obviously you'd love to say, you know, this year we'll be there and we'll be thereabouts. But, Robbie, the, I guess when you listen to Jack talk about that young, young Hawks list and, you know, how they've basically made a distinct, decision as a club to go down that route and bring in the youth and and have a crack at building it up and they know that's going to take time how hard is it uh, you're doing the same with the stable how hard is it to make that decision that there's going to be a little bit of short-term pain while you wait for those youngsters to come through but you've got the end goal to look forward to i think it's the best i think it's music to our ears i think it's the most beautiful words you can hear because i mean Here's Jack, that's a three-time premiership player, to say that, you know, realistically, not this year, but next year, 
and here's Matt and I that have gone into a new new business um, and we've gone out and bought new players the last, you know, 14 months. We've bought a, a group of players last year and then, you know, then this year and we, we, we've harvested those seeds and, you know, we've, we've put those seeds in the ground, we're watching them grow. You know, that takes a while and Jack knows what that's, that, that's like to watch those players grow and develop. You know, and we, Matt and I, unbeknownst to anyone on the on tonight's webinar, we've had a three-hour meeting with a you know nutritionist this afternoon about making sure we've got all the one percenters right with our diets, you know, you know, and all that sort of stuff. You know, so we're behind the scenes, we're making sure we've got everything in order so that when our players grow up, me or the horses, got, hey. Your diet or the horses? No, my diet's fine. Have a look at me. I'm expanding, you know. But um, but we've got everything in order so that as our players evolve, um, we've got everything in the right place so that, you know, um, we can capitalise on their ability to succeed, you know. And, um, you know, yeah, we, we, we like, like, any, like any team, you know, you want to win the flag straight away. But it can't always happen because they're sometimes too immature, you know. So... Do we want to win this year? Absolutely. But realistically, they're going to be too young. So, you know, it'll probably be next year, um, like Jack's saying about the Hawks, you know. And here's one of the best teams we've seen, you know, in the modern era, you know, winning three flags in a row. But um, but that's how, that's how sport works. So we're hoping that uh, we can win tomorrow. But realistically, we've got to let these teams develop, you know. So, yeah, it, it's, it's fantastic to listen to such a successful team like the Hawks and Jack talk about how they, they've done things. And yeah, it's, look, it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And we might just go on to some international uh, news here, Matt. And I guess touching on that youngsters coming through, I think it must be tough uh, for you coming to a new country, starting up from scratch here, building up all these youngsters while dad's over there winning group ones because he's already set up. No, it's not tough at all, Corey. It's nice <laughs> to see the yard being successful. Obviously, I miss, um, I miss uh, all the success, but that's why I've come here is to build my own success. It could have been very easily, easy for me to step into a partnership with my dad and uh, reap all the rewards instant instantaneously. Um, but I'm, I've come here to challenge myself. I know I can do it. I've been there and done it. So, uh, now, myself and Robbie, we like we've been discussing the past 20 minutes, we want to win premierships and we want to win group ones. So uh, we've got the, the right tools to do it. We just need a bit of luck along the way and it will definitely happen. Yeah, and we've got just on the screen there. So I just wanted to touch base for a few of our connections there. There's your mother down the bottom right there, Matt leading in our Matana. So if you want to touch, touch base there with uh, those that might not know uh, about that group one win. Yeah, that was um, last week, Saturday, Corey, a, a big weight for age mile in South Africa. Sheikh Hamdam's uh, very last horse in training with us, unfortunately. Um, so it was nice to to have him win a big race. It was his first group one. He's uh, by deep field, uh, which is great. He was um, bred over here in Australia, shipped over to South Africa. And uh, it's taken him a lot of time to come to hand. He's actually a horse who showed a lot of promise as a two-year-old and then as a three-year-old went completely wayward. But... When you have people that are patient, time is free, but nobody wants it. Uh, when you have people like Sheikh Hamdan that are, well, when he was um, alive, uh, was a very patient owner and still with us. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away, as I said. So this also was given time and they, they're finally starting to reap the rewards. Um, and yeah, it was a very exciting win. And if you just wanted to touch base also, Matt, on a couple of our other owners there, Mary Slack and also the Keyswetter family who had a, had winners at Royal Ascot. Yeah, Mary and uh, the Keyswetter family uh, both purchased yearlings for us this year. Um, they both have uh, their own individual stud breeding farms in South Africa. Um, very, very big players in the industry worldwide. And uh, Mary had uh, a horse win with Jane Chapaheim, a nice three-year-old. Uh, Claymore was his name. Uh, he won a group two at Ascot during the week. So he looks like an exciting young horse. And uh, Ridgemont, the Kiss Peters family, they uh, had a horse win. I think it was just a handicap, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's still a, a big race um, during the Ascot week. To have a winner there is very, very exciting. So 
Uh, nice to have them in the yard. We have them in the yard in South Africa, but it's nice to have them now in Australia. Yeah, and just just on that, we have uh, Wayne Francis is just asking how the imports are settling in that we brought across, but you also have another one coming. Yeah, the ones that have uh, come across are settling in very well. They're exciting horses. They look like the real deal, so hopefully we can uh, get the best out of them. And then, yeah, Cash 22 leaves Newmarket uh, this week. He went into quarantine this morning with uh, Nature Strip and Home Affairs, so... Hopefully, uh, Nature Strip can uh, rub off on him. Um, he's a successful horse uh, in South Africa. He, he ran many placings in some of our biggest races there. So, it'll be good to have him uh, out here in Australia. Yeah, and speaking of Nature Strip, we had uh, Widden Studs Anthony Thompson on uh, our last webinar. So, congratulations to everyone at Widden and all the connections for Nature Strip. Obviously, he's not owned by Widden, but he's a Nakoni, so they've done quite well standing standing Nakoni. Uh, and then State of Rest and Artorias both ran fantastically well over there. And owners of ours uh, with Newgate obviously are in the stable. Um, we have a, a filly from them, uh, so it's it's always good to see the Aussie connections doing well overseas. And we're we definitely have travel envy. I was speaking to you, Matt, during the week, and we definitely had travel envy looking at the hot weather and the top hats and the, and the, also the Dubai carnival. But it won't be long, and next year we'll be, we'll be sending ours over. Yeah, what a week of racing. It was very, very exciting to watch. And uh, we'd love to be there one day, but not only as a supporter, we'd love to be there competing. Um, even the top, top trainer, Chris Waller, and top jockey, Jay, uh, James McDonald, they... They thrive on, on competition and uh, they were successful. And I think that's only going to create more, more um, hunger to be there. So uh, one day, one day, that's, uh, we'd like to be there. And Jack, do you follow the, the Royal Ascot meeting or is it a bit, bit late to be staying up before you go to footy training the next day? Uh, well, I had some pretty tired days because we had five days off and it just worked perfectly with the Royal Ascot meeting. So <laughs> uh, I reckon I was about 1.30 I got I got two most nights and a few of us boys were together. So um, we might have had a beer or two and stayed up and watched a few of the races. So um, awesome. no, it was good. It was cool. It makes you really want to be able to get there and go go along. Um, I've actually got a question. I'd, sorry to go off topic. Here. Yeah, yeah, go we're for it. We're all intrigued probably over the past week. Either Matt or Robbie can answer it. Um, we looked at a lot of, I guess, the preparations of Aussie horses running 1,200, then stepping it up, 14, 16, where you look at the internationals and they almost – pretty much start at 2000 meters like how come how come it is so different over there uh to here robbie oh well it's just it, it's just the way it is in in the sense that here we tend to be probably i suppose um economically viable in the way that we've got the opportunity to finance our way through you know we tend to have an opportunity to um pay our way and uh finance our way through and where over there it's more traditionalist we they just go straight into it and they don't tend to worry so much about the finances um that just tends to be the way it is um for years and years and years even the great bar cummings right back to years ago he would kick off in the Ori Star over 1,200 and run his way into into races. And um, that's just the way we've, we've, we've done it, you know. It doesn't mean you can't you can't do it. You can you can step a stay straight into a staying race, and we have done it here, and we can do it here. Um, we can prepare him to, to run him straight into a staying race here. But economically, we've been able to win prize money on the way through here, so we've done it that way. That's just the way yeah. we've done it here. Does that make sense? Yeah. And Matt, you've you've yeah, been over yeah, there. Absolutely. They they do tend to keep their horses in in longer in the stables as well. So, do you want to touch on that for Jack? Yeah, I would say that um, Australia's facilities when it comes to pre training and beaches, um, you know, to have little let ups. Oh, oh, they're the world leader in in get freshening horses up. Where you get places like America, where they move from state to state to stay away from the winter, so they don't really ever have a break. Um, and in England, 
they have quite a short season because the winter racing, they don't really race their horses. So you might think that they don't have a break, but they do have a break. They, they probably race only nine months of the year. And then from November, December, January, they don't race at all. So, uh, you know, it is, it's a bit of a, like Robbie said, it's a bit of an economical thing in Australia where you maybe only have 60 stables on course, but you have 160 horses on your, on your books and you got to rotate the horses in and out, give everyone, you know, a chance to race and, and try and get them to peak at certain where they're going to benefit financially at the best time of the year for them. Whereas in England, if you had 60 horses on your books, all 60 would probably be in training at one time. Yeah. And Robbie, just this links in with Jack's question, but I know that we've there are less races for young progressive stayers here, and it is a lot a lot of sprint races out there. Is is that also just due to prize money and the economics of it? Or is there, you know, is there a reason there's not as many distance races for young horses comparatively to, to other countries? Yeah, yeah, probably a little bit of that and wagering and uh, a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the sense that sometimes in Australian racing, when there's not a lot of there's not a lot of runners in a particular race, they don't tend to put that race on next year, and then nobody programs for it, and accordingly, and so on. So, what tends to happen is is that nobody prepares for the next year, and so on. So you tend to not have as many people preparing for so. What tends to happen is, well, like I said a, a, a minute ago, it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy where you don't have that support for it. So um, we're trying to change that culture, if that makes sense. If you have more and more need for stayers, you will have more and more races put on that program. And then you need more and more support. If we have more and more um, fields of 10, 12, 14, 16, running for good Vobus dollars or Bob's in Sydney or Cutis in, uh, in Queensland and you get fields of 10, 12, 14, 16, then the uh, governing body in each state will put up that good prize money and so on. And then the, the races will survive accordingly. And that's sort of how it works in each, in each state. So hopefully that's what will support each category, whether it be a two-year-old sprint, three-year-old mile or a three-year-old staying race hopefully that answers that question yeah does that sort of help there jack with the question we sort of went a long way around it but probably covered a yeah. few topics no, there. Mate, it, was, it was great it was just fascinating to know and as i said before there's different afl clubs train differently and different codes train differently everywhere so uh, it was fascinating to just find out the reason why Australia did things the way they do. I did a webinar with Henry Field a while back and they were asking why, you know, we stand stallions that are mainly sprinters and why there's such a such a thirst for sprinters in, in Australia and early speed. And, and Henry sort of thought that it was probably a lot to do with our climate. And he said it's very similar in, in America in the, in the warmer warmer areas there as well they have the same sort of thought process and, and that may be also why the UK and New Zealand have, have stays. Would that be a fair comment, Matt? Oh, I, 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 I don't know. I kind of, it's a big debate because three of the major races in Australia are the Cox Plate, the Caulfield Cup and the Melbourne Cup. So, mm. I mean, it's a weird, it's a weird system here in that the racing's geared towards instantaneous success. They're trying to get, you know, as, as quick a return on the investment as they can, buy a young horse race as a two-year-old, when actually the majors are the long-distance races. Yeah, you can have a blue diamond and a golden slipper winner, but there's a lot of money in staying races, especially in Australia, and hence the reason why uh, so many people are bringing horses from, from Europe to here, because there is a lot of money in staying races. And you go to America... And their majors are all long distance races, the Kentucky Derby, Preakness, Belmont Stakes, England, the, the English Derby. So it's very weird. Uh, you know, I, I personally love the long distance races and uh, it's, you, you're going to find there might be a problem in time to come here because we are importing a lot of stallions that are shuttling from overseas like, like uh, Highland Reels and Frankels and uh, State of Rest will be shuttling soon. And they're all 10 furlong, 10 furlong plus um, stallions. So 
they're going to need more races over ground for the younger horses because uh, it's a bit of a chicken and egg scenario. If you don't put the races on, then you're not going to have the the horses. So uh, it's yeah, it's going to be interesting. Yeah, and um, obviously I had a question here from Terry who was had asked this a while back. Um, and I've just answered it now because I knew I was coming up to this. But Jack, which other horses are you involved in in at the stable? So here's this big guy on the screen. Yeah, the Lane May machine, and um, pretty keen with this one. I spoke to Corey early on when the guys purchased, and then um, my like last visit when I came out to the stables with speaking to the boys, they were um, talking about how much of a beast this this guy was, and um, Look, I own a fair few fillers and this is my first cult. So I'm pretty pretty keen to, to race this big fella and um, got my dad involved as well. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty keen to get this one to the racetrack at the right time. And Robbie, I know you're very excited about this guy and have been since we saw him at the sales. And once you went in the ring, you were, there was no stopping you. You became Rocky Balboa once the, once the, <laughs> that auction started. Yeah. Exactly, and even the heavyweight division because I know how fat I am. But, uh, but uh, yeah, no, I was very, we were very bullish. I mean, Mike, uh, Matt, and myself were very bullish on him because he he just looks a Group One horse in the sense that he's he's got the girth and the body and the and the strength and the rump and he's got everything you want in a in a horse. He he just looks a Group One horse. So, you know, Lean Me Machine was a Group One quality horse and. This horse has everything on on both sides. He's got he's got a bit of stamina and a bit of sprint. He's got everything, you know. So, um, you know, so we think that he's got the ingredients. He's, he's surprisingly incredibly well developed for a November foal, and um, and you can also see his rumps higher than his wither. So we think that he's got scope as well as as as, as early speed. So we think that he's got everything you look for, and. Um, and uh, he's, he's by a very, uh, you know, being a first season sire, we, you know, is, is always that uh, unknown uh, excitement about uh, a young sire like that. So we absolutely loved him and we couldn't wait to secure him. And we just kept putting our hand up until we got him. So he's broken him beautifully and uh, he moves like a gazelle. So we're, uh, we're very excited about him. So anyway, it's fingers crossed. He's unbeaten at this stage. So we're, uh, we're very happy about him. And and Matt, um, you will notice if you go through what we've bought, we had the ones that we've had a real crack at. So we had this guy, we got the grunt cult that we got, and quite a, uh, we got a couple of American pharaohs the year before. And I guess the question mark would be, okay, you've, we've gone for first season size, they're not proven, but but why not get the very best of what we saw at the sales from the lean mean machines? And this guy was the best lean mean machine we saw anywhere in the sales complexes and same with the grunt cult we bought. Why not get those rather than the uh, 50th best snits or the 100th best written tycoon? And that was, that was really what we went in with that attitude, didn't we? Well, I think the last year, um, this last sales season, we went in with the attitude of buying horses that we love. Um, I can understand buying the 50th best schnitzel, but as long as you loved it. Um, so we bought Zoo Stars and we bought, um, uh, you know, Frankel's the year before. Uh, so we, we're buying it from the best stallions, but we're also identifying young stallions that have a lot of, uh, hopefully got a lot of upside. And horses like this Lean Mean Machine was probably one of the standout physical specimens throughout all the catalogs during the year. So uh, when we, when they see a horse like this, then you really want to, you know, bring it back to uh, Cranbourne and put a saddle on it in the mornings. So uh, we, we were strong on him. And if he looks, if he runs half as good as he looks, you know, the guys will have a lot of fun. Yeah, and then it, there is 15%, so my sales pitch now, there is 15% still left in him. So Jack, whether your your mates at the Hawks get in or whether there's people watching and want to race with Jack, he's in that. And obviously he'll run in the colours of Rupert Lee, so the Chautauqua colours. Um, so they're, some, they're pretty some, good at going first past the post, aren't they? They go all right, yep. They they do win a few races to Farne, Ch Chautauqua, and there's a few good ones still on the track. You could make a you could write a book. The with thing them that on. the thing that Matt didn't tell anyone there is that he's uh, his good friend Samson that uh, works at Blue Gum. That was his top pick of the uh, of all the. I think there was about 42 yearlings at uh, Blue Gum. That that was his favourite horse. 
Yeah, and he did it. He did, he did lead a lot of horses, good horses, uh, throughout the sales period. So it's a, it's a good eye for a horse, Samson. So we move. How, how do you to, how do you two settle your disagreements in the uh, in the play in the planning of the uh, English sales? Arm wrestle. Or do you say, all right, you can get? <laughs> Is there <laughs> any? Matt how how do you go it. with that? The planning of it. Um, Matt normally wins. So I can, Jack, basically I hassle them to get a list and then I get a list from all, all of them. Um, but basically we have six people go around the sales. They all look um, and then they'll come together as a group. And effectively, is this, correct me if I'm wrong, Robbie, but you won't bid on anything that not all six of you tip. Yep. No, that's true. No, we have, I mean, Peter Ford does all the pedigrees. Matt and I muscle up them um, jointly together because we've got to look at them every morning at 4 a.m. The vets have to agree. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty strict criteria. And unless we all collectively agree, um, they just don't come home. Simple as that. Because there's nothing worse than going to work at 4 a.m. and looking at a horse that you aren't impressed with. Yeah. yeah, simple as that. Uh, that'd be tough. But we're just <laughs> exactly. Gonna... <laughs> exactly. So we'll just touch quickly here, Robbie, on these four cults here, and I'll also launch a poll. So yeah. just there's a little poll that will launch on your screens there for those watching. Um, but we've obviously got the so you think out of Greta G, which we bought at He's the Sydney. Sold, so he was sold, but he temp, uh, one owner had to drop out for some oh, financial okay. issues, yeah. and there's five percent in him. So he was he's sold. Just so you, he's just so you think. I mean, he's the hottest stand in Australia. Yeah, and he, it was about 120 or something ridiculous, wasn't he? Yeah. We stop, we stole him. So he won't take two minutes to sell. I would be surprised if I haven't actually he's... put it put too much into that, but we'll sell him. Um, the brazen bow pride rock there. Robbie, some thoughts on him. He's a bit oh, of a... Oh, well, I mean, he's a bit of a speed outstanding Stan and Pride Rock's a, a sister to uh, Lone Rock, a Group 1 winner. So, I mean, he really sells himself. I mean, he's got the pedigree to be a Group 1 horse, so that's pretty straightforward, that one. right? Yeah, and I'll touch on you, Matt, for the epaulet. Obviously, had, had a bit of success with the epaulets, and um, he, he was a nice one. Yeah, well, epaulet produced the Blue Diamond winner this year, so... Um... He's a quiet stallion that, that goes under the radar a little bit, but this was definitely the best epaulet I've seen in the last two years I've been in Melbourne, in, in Australia. So uh, definitely can get that one. Also out of a Londro mare. So a lot of the, I think in the Blue Diamond, it was four or five runners that were out of Londro mares and then yep. an epaulet won it. So that's, he's got Blue Diamond written all over him. Yep. And Robbie, to turn me loose. Well, the general theme amongst all four here is you got the hottest stand in Australia in So You Think. Brazen Bow's got an unbelievable strike rate out of a sister to a Group 1 winner in Pride Rock. Epaulette, who just had the Blue Diamond winner. Turn Me Loose, who, after we bought this horse, had three Group 1 winners in the next month. Out of a Nakoni mare, who's the sire of uh, in Nature Strip. So what we tried to do all year when purchasing horses for the future like Jack was saying about Hawthorne and rebuilding sporting teams and AFL and everything like that, if you build the foundation correctly, you've got a great future ahead of you. So all these horses in front of you, whatever happens in the future, we don't know for sure. But if you build, if you buy correctly and build the future as good as you can, you're going to give yourself the greatest chance. And what, we, what we're saying here is that, say you think hot, raise and bow proven, Epaulette, Group 1, uh, Blue Diamond, and Turn Me Loose, three Group 1 winners after we bought the um, bought this colt. So you're pretty safe in any of these selections, and I'm surprised that most of these horses have shares in them. So it doesn't really matter what you have a crack at. Um, whatever floats your boat or whatever fits your budget, you're pretty safe in any of the above because they're all proven. And that's the theme of what Matt and I, Peter Ford, the vets and the selection criteria have tried to buy throughout the year. And that applies to any of the horses that we've selected for Griffiths the Cock Racing moving forward, you know. And that's that's the most important thing that we've tried to, to put forward throughout the year. 
And it is funny the ones that um that 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 sell like hotcakes and those that don't. So I I personally went into the term you loose and the epaulet and I thought they'd fly out the door and here, here we are we've still got a little bit in them. So some yeah, lucky know. owners will jump in and, and get the upside. So Jack, if you had to pick out of those four, which one takes your eye to well, I'll the say things. I'll put you on. I'll put you on. So. I'll put you on the spot there. Yeah. So. No, well, the say things are fine at the moment. So that's uh, they're hot property. So I'm surprised, even as Robbie said, that there's a little bit left in that one. So no doubt yeah, no. I'm going to have my third horse in a stable shortly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one just popped actually a couple of days ago. So um, you know, there's always oh, yeah. some. I think to be fair, that one was sold. That was just a little bit of a default situation, you know. No, I thought I'd throw it on here and tempt Jack. You see, so <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so um, rubber arm, so it works too well. I'll go through a couple more questions here, guys. While I've got these up there, so Luke Glossop says, "Big Hawks fan, and I've got shares in Hibernia Queen, and just wanted to know how she's going out in the paddock, Robbie." Yep, all good. Um, resting up, you know, developing everything good. Typical of all young horses, just growing, you know, doing what young horses do. So just waiting on her to um, continue her growth spurt. So, yep, all good. And Jack, uh, David Kemmerich just said, obviously, you know, with with horses, um, you know, they don't take too well to having fetlock injuries and wanted to know how your fetlock was. <laughs> yeah, mine's... Uh... Mine's coming along. It's I'm touch and go for this week, and hopefully, um, if not this week, then definitely next week. But um, yeah, I tried to get up for my mate's two hundred fiftieth games uh, about two weeks ago now, and um, of course, as it is, the the ankle that's injured is the one that gets rolled on again. So um, yeah, that put me out last week. But trying all everything I possibly can do to get back on the field because um, yeah, it's a uh, as horse racing is nervous watching, I'm pretty nervous watching the boys play footy at the same time as well. Yeah. And Matt, the Wayne, Wayne Lee just wanted to know, so I was calling Wayne Francis before, but it's Wayne Lee. He just wants to know how the American Pharaohs are going. Yeah, they're going good, Corey. Uh, Prince of Cairo had his first jump out this morning as a gelding and uh, he ran second on the bridle. Uh, we thought he was a nice young horse. He had one run where he just pulled up uh, just a little bit sore all over, muscle sore, and uh, needed gelding badly. So uh, he looks to be going well. And then the other American Pharaoh also uh, needed gelding. So he's come back in after gelding. He hasn't had a jump out yet, but uh, was showing us a lot of speed uh, when he got up to doing some speed work in his previous preparation. Um, they're going very well. There are only two American Pharaohs. Oh, we've got an um, American Pioneer as well, who's a, a pretty uh, stamina-rich American Pharaoh, so uh, he'll he'll be not long in winning, uh, but those are the two young ones that we bought at uh, Magic Millions a, a year ago, and I see that they're really going well on the track, though they're starting yeah. to improve their results. So hopefully ours will be not too long in winning. Yeah, I um I thought we should buy one at the Weanling sales, and we couldn't get our hands on anything, so we that, they would have been. I think they'll go back up in value next year. The American Pharaoh is just starting to kick a goal now. Uh, just Robbie, despite this from Nick Stab, um, despite those fetching red drapes behind Robbie, focusing on performance, can you please elaborate further as to why a horse Kevin. would have a refresher at the breakers? So I sent out today to Cepedo out of Therese's choice, and he's he's having a, a he's having a refresher at the breakers. So why would a horse have a refresher? Is the question. Uh Normally, uh, most horses have a refresher, and, and in his case, because they just get mentally a little bit stale, and they don't want to listen to the early education of the uh, the breaking in facility. So basically, like a young uh, student doesn't want to listen to the teacher. So giving them a little bit of time out to have a mental rest, and then come back and listen to the teacher. That's basically a mental refresher um, in human terms. You know, so that's that's pretty much how it is, Nick. That's yeah, sort of so, how it works. So we'd go to the breaker, have a little spell when they've had enough, yep. and then come back into the breaker before they come to a stable. Pretty much when they're ready to listen again, yeah. Yep. And Stephen Watts, this is another one for you. 
Robbie, and it's quite a good question, but his numbers are slightly off because he's obviously looked on our website at how many horses we have on there because we haven't got rid of any of the horses that we've sold and we've sold a good, you know, 40 in the last 12 yeah. months. Um, yeah. But he's just saying that we, we seem to have a majority of two-year-olds or younger. Um, and so will you have to reduce your yearling purchases after next year and, or do you need more boxes or do you need a list manager like AFL clubs? Uh, no, no, and no, because we've actually got a um, we've actually got an empty uh, box at the moment, so we don't have a problem with uh, vacancy and uh, and uh, and and issues like it like that. So that's not a problem. It's uh, more so that uh, we're just going to flow them through, and um, we're going to sell on the ones that uh, that are ready to go to the breeding barn, and the ones that uh, can't play. Uh, you know, four four quarters in, in Jack's terms and all that sort of stuff that aren't going to kick uh, too many goals and all that sort of issues. So, so what we'll we'll do, we'll gradually work all that out. But um, no, we won't have a problem with all those sort of uh, issues. So we'll uh, we'll gradually work through those. But uh, we we just want a team that'll win all year round. And at the moment, we're going to be spasmodic in how we win win races because there's 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 youth. And um, and as youth comes through, they're going to be a little bit spasmodic in how they win because they're all going to be all the same age and they're not going to win at the same time. Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because in Steve's stats here, he said that we have just 21 horses that are four years or over. And I would actually, based on the other stats there, we've probably got less than that because I know we've moved okay. on a few that are actually uh, in those age brackets. So we would probably have less than, you know, we'd probably have around 10 horses max. Would that be fair yeah. to say? Yeah, that'd be fair to say. And it could even be less than that soon. We could even be, we could even be left with, you know, King Magnus and Hal Wars and, and a few others soon that would only be left standing in that category. And most of them would be nearly gone soon because of that uh, move out. It, it, it'd be nearly all youth very, very soon. Yeah. Yeah. So both exciting but challenging at the same time. 100%. That's ex exactly right. Exciting and challenging. Yep, correct. And uh, Wayne's just asking me how DeLong Star pulled up after today's race. Probably better than I did after my, my interview, Wayne. Um, I was a bit, <laughs> bit nervous going into that. But no, she pulled, she pulled up okay, didn't she, Robbie? Just I, think it's bit, I think it's fair to say she pulled up better than Matt and I because Matt and I said, uh, recently, never ever enter a horse at Ballarat. And some, uh, some silly person that I look at in the mirror said, Matt, don't be silly. We need to go to Ballarat because the tracks are wet. And um, he said, don't do it. And I said, no, nah, come on, let's let's have a crack. And we shouldn't have, but we did. Yeah, since it's, it's some... a rotten track. It's a rotten track. They should blow it up, that joint. It's a benevolent fun for Ballarat trainers, I'm telling you. Yeah. Hey Jack, I reckon you'd get fined if you said that about um, the anything any of the AFL venues, wouldn't you? We'll pay the fine. Have a crack. Mate, have a crack, Jack. We'll pay the fine. Go on. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what I can and can't say these days. It's uh, you got to be pretty careful with what you say. How but, much are the fines? Um, can we chip in? Uh, yeah. I'll, yeah, you can give me a couple percent of a horse, and you can. Right. Say whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, all, all the stadiums are, are pretty good. I can't really complain too much. They're pretty lucky. Yeah, and Matt, the question from Adam West: How are the Russian revolutions that we have in the stable going? Yeah, they're going good, Corey. They're taking uh, a little bit more time than we probably expected. Um, we bought bought uh, Russian the three that we bought um, probably have a lot of upside. So. Uh, uh, well, fishing, fishing. He he won early in the season, but he he still won on pure raw, raw talent, and uh, he's back in now doing some some early work. So um, I think they look like quality horses. They all look like athletes, um, and they've been racing extremely well. They've been uh, you know performing at the highest level. So it'll be interesting to go see how they go over the next uh, couple of months. But I, you know, the yearling sales again, I wouldn't be scared to to go into another one. That's for sure. Yeah, and uh, just I think that's about it with our questions. I might have a look at the poll here. So the most popular cult there was actually the Brazen Bow by one vote. So that's not bad. There's a little bit Nature Strip was the most popular. I'll tell you what's a little bit oxymoron here, though, is 
the most popular. So which webinar, I guess, have you most enjoyed? And it says, I prefer to hear from Robbie and Matt. That's actually the, in, in terms of all our, our guests, so stud farm Corey, guests. Was it? They all got, Corey. no, they all got votes and Matt and Robbie. But then the next question was, what would you change about the webinars? And it said more variety of guests. So that doesn't make any sense, but I think they're trying to trick me there. Um, but thanks very much, everyone, for for obviously being involved tonight. Um, and before we go, obviously, Jack, a big thanks for coming on. Uh, best of luck for the rest of the season. I know that we'll be be speaking with your about your horses, but we don't often get the chance to talk to you about AFL. Yeah, well, can just... I ask Jack a question? Yeah, go for it. Jack, did you have a choice to come back to um, Hawthorne early in your career? Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, um, Adelaide wanted to keep me on and um, I pretty much made a decision along with my family that uh, if I'm feeling that at that time after two years, then um, there's a strong chance I could feel it after my next contract or the one after. And my theory was I wanted to forge a long, long career at one club and I've been fortunate enough to be able to do that. Um, probably exceeded the length that I'd be playing AFL football. So um, I credit that to the strong culture. And as I mentioned before, the, the guys that I got to learn off of some of the superstars of the game that helped me um, so far push out 13 years of AFL football. So you you got the, you got actually got to choose your club? Yeah, yeah. I was, I was out of contract and then I chose um, Hawthorne, but then the two clubs had to work out a trade, which... There was a little Fantastic. bit of back and forth because yeah. Crows weren't too happy with um, me leaving after two years, which was probably fair enough when they drafted me yeah. um, as an 18 year old. And yeah. I did my oh, apprenticeship yeah. there and then I came to the Hawks and yeah. played straight away there. So I understood both parties. I should have known though, you had Hawks coloured hair when you were playing for Adelaide. <laughs> so. <laughs> I'm going to join the next webinar that. and I expect, I expect an 18 year old photo of you as well, Corey. Oh, they're not good. That. I think you I had the same. <laughs> I think I had the same. I think I had the same as you, Jack. To be honest, because I think back, so it was. It was actually in fashion back uh, then. So. Robbie, it was. It was. I'm going to get him some earpods. So, anyway, thanks very much, Jack. Really appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I mean, really, I, I thought it was really intriguing to listen to you speak about the the synergy between AFL and horse racing. And uh, we thank you for coming on and appreciate all the support you're giving the stable. Yep. No worries, guys. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. No worries, Jack. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.